is uh, Mark Banker. Uh, he's with the Rough Grouse Society. And uh, along with him, it will be uh, Tom Matthews, who is a uh, wildlife biologist working with the Wildlife Management in Institute. Uh, Mark Banker is the senior biologist with the uh, Rough Grouse Society at State College, Pennsylvania. He has a BS degree in wildlife science from Penn State and a master's in wildlife science from Virginia Tech. Um, also, with, uh, Tom is going to be working with uh, Mark in reference to talking about the American Woodcock Conservation Plan and talk about the decline of the, uh, the woodcock populations and the national effort to restore the population. <coughs> Mark Banker. Let me thank you again for being here. Really appreciate it. Mac has put his heart and soul into creating this day, and uh, I'm really, really glad that uh, so many of you showed up because um, Mac has really worked hard on this, and I don't know how many hundreds of emails have gone back and forth between us and Mac. And, so it's good to, to see this turn out. I hope everybody had fun this morning. And, and I appreciate, in the Rook Grouse side, I appreciate this opportunity to, to talk about American Woodcock. We got the, a great lead in by Dr. Bell uh, because we're going to sort of step it up in the successional um, line and talk about a shrubland young forest bird, which is an American Woodcock. He talked about how quail and a game bird and a songbird had some sort of similar declines, and you could do, I could do the same thing all day long for woodcock and all the non-game species that share the same kind of habitat. Uh, it's the same type of thing um, that we're dealing with in Maryland and throughout the eastern United States. So I'm going to focus, I'm going to focus on Maryland. I, uh, I do work for the Rough Grouse Society, obviously, and I cover about 10 states. Maryland is one of them. I live in State College, Pennsylvania. Um, so, but today we're going to focus on the woodcock. How many of you knew before today, if you had seen this picture, what that was? How many of you would have known? Okay. Pretty much everybody. Good. That's good. You know, this is a bird that a lot of folks don't know that much about. It's pretty small. Um, it likes to be incognito. It's often in, in thick habitat. It is, uh, it's got the coloration that's going to allow it to blend in. It's not out strutting around like a turkey or a pheasant or something like that. It's mostly in thick cover trying to hide and go about its, its business. So some folks don't really know that much about it. What you find is that folks either know very little or they know a heck of a lot. Fortunately, there are some very enthusiastic people when it comes to woodcock out there, both on the biology side and the hunting side, and, and some on the birding side, uh, which is good. And there's a major initiative right now to help woodcock in the eastern United States that Tom Matthews is going to tell us more about where a, a big pot of money is being managed by the Wildlife Management Institute, and then many of us are, are partnering with them to put the habitat on the ground. And that's a really good thing. So woodcock are getting some attention. Um, that long bill, obviously very unique. Uh, it sort of reminds you of a shorebird, but you know this is an upland bird that uses that long beak for probing in the, in the ground for earthworms. Looks a lot like a snipe. And uh, we have a big hunt in northern Minnesota every year, and every year, someone, almost every year, someone comes in, throws a snipe down on the table, and tries to fool us. You know, we've only seen a few hundred thousand woodcock, you know, and they're going to try and fool us with snipe. But some people do get them confused, and one of the, the kind of the neat ways, besides, you had them side by side, they really don't look that much alike other than their bills, but the stripes on a woodcock's head go side to side, and on a, uh, on a snipe, they go back and forth. And uh, if you've ever hunted snipe, they're a lot of fun to hunt, too. And I suppose you have some probably overwintering here and, and even breeding here, snipe on mud flats and whatnot. Uh, but there is some confusion there. Okay, here's what American woodcock population have been doing region-wide, um, both in the central flyway, which is kind of Pennsylvania west, and the eastern flyway, which is kind of Pennsylvania, Ohio border uh, east, the eastern flyway. Um, Major declines over the last, since 1968, when they first started doing woodcock surveys. You can see that this doesn't look like a very steep line, but from four to two, it's 50%. So that's a, that's a huge decrease. We're seeing some flattening out of that line, as you can see there, where things are starting to stabilize at a, at a place much lower than we'd really like it, but it's better than seeing that, that decline continuing. That's not necessarily the case for the, the surveys in Maryland, which I'm going to show you. Um, in Maryland, the singing ground surveys in 2010, which was last spring, um, and this is counting singing male woodcock, 
breeding male woodcock, in, another, in other words, a 4% decrease from the previous year. That's meaningless in the grand scheme of things. You can't tell anything from one year. If you look from 2000 to 2010, about a 4% decrease per year. That's not good. You look at 1968 to the present, 3.7% decrease per year in woodcock, singing male woodcock in Maryland. That's really not good. And we've had a lot of people look at this from, from six million different ways, and it all comes back to habitat. So what I want to show you a little bit of is how you can improve habitat, and particularly to, to give uh, woodcock everything they need for breeding and, and nesting and making more of themselves, obviously. Um, hunting does not really have much effect on woodcock. They have decreased the bag limit and decreased the bag limit, and it hasn't had any effect on on uh, the number of woodcock out there, or at least we can't find it statistically or scientifically. And they've also done some recent studies where they banned, they uh, put radio collars on woodcock, and then they um, they recorded the mortality. They followed the birds around in the haunts and stuff. And it turns out we're not nearly as good a woodcock hunter as we think we are, because there were there were times when guys were sitting there with their radio telemetry, and they had three or four woodcock in a cover. That they, and they knew they were there, and guys kept going through with their dogs, and going through with their dogs, and going through with their dogs, and those woodcocks stayed right there. <laughs> they missed them. You know, and all the time I have guys go, tell me, you know, my dog is awesome. If there's a bird there, he'll find it. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. You don't know what ones are there that they didn't find. So that's always, a, you know, that's always an easy statement to make. But we're not nearly as good at killing them as we think we are, and the, the, bag, the three bird bag limit just doesn't doesn't really make any difference. So that, that's good if you're a hunter and you're worried about that. Um, the the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, when you go and buy your license and you're going to hunt migratory birds, you buy that little, that little stamp or whatever, they ask you those questions. How many ducks? How many coots? How many this, that, and the other thing? Woodcock being one of them. And they get an idea of how many hunters and how many days of field and all that kind of thing. And uh, this is sort of the, the rundown of the top states. And you can see that Pennsylvania is the top state in terms of effort and number of hunters, if you believe you know, the data, which much of which is collected at Walmart and stuff like that. Uh, and Maryland doesn't really, you know, they're really not, you're not really a heavy hitter in terms of hunting woodcock. You have some great places to hunt woodcock, and you have some very dedicated hunters. You just don't have a lot of them. Um, and they're only expanding if these numbers are to be believed. And, and you've got to take this with a little bit of grain. You know, they're only expanding about two days a year per hunter, whereas up here you're talking um, four days per year per hunter, a little bit different. And what's kind of interesting, just as an aside, is that South Carolina and Florida have a fair amount of effort, and I think you know, that's where the birds end up right now, and then they have some fun goofing around with them because um, they have a much later season than we do. And I've confirmed that with some of the guys in South Carolina. They love taking their bird dogs out and keeping them warmed up on, on woodcock, um, which we've already shot at the whole way down the, down the flight line. This is where woodcock are now. They're a migratory bird, as I think most of you know. Um, if you're a bird that probes for earthworms, can't do that very well right now, um, especially if there's snow on the ground like you had last year. With, in a year that's kind of balmy and not a lot of, not a lot of snow, you might find that woodcock will stick around here in the eastern shore of Maryland all year. And this is as far south as they'll go. They'll come out of New England and stay here. They'll stay in southern New Jersey as well. Last year, obviously, they probably were as far south as they could get themselves because of the way the weather stacked up. And this year hasn't been a picnic either in terms of if you're a woodcock. So you're going to find you know, the vast majority of those birds down here spending the winter. And you can see kind of a high density right there. And then in the summer, in the spring, in, in a few weeks, birds will start moving back up through here, maybe even sooner. If we, if we get that balmy weather next week, you're probably going to see some woodcock singing already in, in, uh, in, Mar- in eastern shore of Maryland. Um, but most of the nesting occurs much farther north. Uh, the breeding birds will breed, males will display and breed with hens all the way up during migration. They'll stop, they'll sing, they'll breed, they'll keep going, they'll do it again, and they'll do it all the way up until they get up here to the primary breeding and nesting grounds. And why they choose, you know, to, to nest farther north, I don't know um, exactly why. Why it would seem to me it would be a lot better to nest on the eastern shore of Maryland than in Ontario. If you're especially if you've got to deal with spring weather and Woodcock nests very early, March, April, and you got some terrible weather still going on there, but for some reason that's the way it works for them. 
And when I talk about a singing male, what a male would call, how many of you have seen or understand what a male does when he's singing? Okay, not, not nearly, uh, not even half. Um, a male woodcock will, will pick a little opening in an otherwise shrubby um, area, and he'll do a kind of march around in a little spot, and he'll pee. Best I can do. Sorry. <laughs> and he'll do that for a while. And that is the sound that we use to count male woodcock. So you'll see, it's, it was like the bird, a lot like the bird survey that Dr. Bell talked about. You... You drive, you stop, you get out, you listen for two minutes, and you count the number of different birds you hear painting, and then you move on. And it's very loud and very easy to, to pick up. Now, older people have a very tough time hearing it, so you gotta watch out. I've been out with guys where there was a woodcock 50 yards away, it's blowing my eardrums out, and that person couldn't hear it at all. So when you get older, that happens. Um, but after he's done kind of marching around on the ground, and uh, presumably there's females off on the, in the cover watching him do this and evaluating his performance. Um, he flies up in the air and he flies round and round in bigger and bigger and bigger circles, way up in the sky. And his, his wings and his voice are making a twittering sound. And then when he does that for a, a minute or so, then all of a sudden he'll start making this weird chirping sound and he'll go and go right back almost to the same spot and do it all over again. And the time of day they do this, and they use... These openings in thick cover are very important. They won't sing if they don't have these openings to do it with. And this can be a mowed trail or it can be an opening that's been mowed on purpose like this. This is um, on the shores of Lake Erie. This is a vast shrubland that's loaded with woodcock. And it would be solid shrubs, but they mow these openings so that those males have a place to sing. And that's important. Now, I'm guessing down here on the eastern shore that openings aren't, uh, aren't in short supply. But if you have a nice shrub land, you want those openings to be in the middle of the shrubs, not, not outside of the shrubs. So that's something to think about if you're managing your, your property. Um, woodcock sing at dusk. After the sun goes down, got a little twilight, so a lot of times you can't see them when they're down here, but when they get up above the horizon, down here the horizon is a lot lower than it is in Pennsylvania where this picture was taken, you can see them very well up in the sky. And you can move in on them and get pretty close. And as long as you don't do anything crazy, they oftentimes won't spook. So it's very observable and very interesting. Um, and I've taken dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of people out and showed them the, uh, the singing, and it's really exciting, especially if you've never seen it before. Like I said, it's very observable. Um, you don't have to be any kind, of a, any kind of a special anything to see it. You just need to find yourself a shrubby area that is a good place for woodcock and you can see it. And again, it's gonna start very soon here on the eastern shore. How, uh, how large do those openings need to be, and how large is too large? Good question. How large do the openings need to be? Um, I would say uh, anything from maybe a tenth of an acre on, on up to you know an acre or so. But smaller ones, more on the half an acre or less, are probably better. They don't want to be too far from cover, so they're not going to get way out. Don't use the edge of, a, oh, great, of a open fields like this and whatnot. Um, 